from Galilee. A love story by Marjorie Holmes. Today we begin chapter four in this series of readings from an edited version of the book Two from Galilee, published by Fleming H. Ravel Company, written by Marjorie Holmes. Uh, yesterday we heard some of Joseph's background, uh, how he basically left Mary alone after thinking that other suitors were coming after her. And yet, Joseph found out that he was being invited over to Mary's house. Uh, Mary's father Joachim came, made the invitation, and they were even going to have a duck that night to eat. As we ended chapter 3, Joachim headed back toward home. Joseph got ready for the evening meal, and now we pick up with the meal almost prepared as we continue with chapter 4 from Two from Galilee. The meal was almost ready. The bread had been baked and was cooling. The table was set. Anxiously, Mary surveyed the bowls of curds, the dishes of dates and raisins, the squat earthen mugs of wine. In a few weeks, there would have been fresh vegetables from the garden, she thought with regret. But no matter, the duck would compensate. Its aroma roasting on the spit outside intensified her affection for her father. Wiping her hands, she raced into the yard to turn it once again. The fat dripped into the fire, smoking and hissing. The flesh was turning a golden brown. Matthew, she summoned, come keep an eye on the duck. Don't let it burn. Esau, your sense of smell is keen. You warn him when it's time to be turned. She flew inside, glancing at the table with a, a start of pride. Its white linen cloth and the best goatskin rugs and cushions which she'd spread down beside it. Then she climbed the ladder to the loft to freshen herself. But first she pulled aside the drapery and looked into her mother's room. Hannah laid huddled on her pallet, one hand flung over her eyes. Mary tiptoed in. Is your head any better, mother? Let me sponge it for you. She knelt and dipped a napkin into the basin of water and vinegar that stood on the floor. But her mother turned away. No, no, don't bother yourself. You have more important things to do. Nothing is more important than the health of my mother. It grieves me to know when you're suffering. Oh, it's nothing, Hannah said. There are worse pains. Yes, worse pains, Mary thought. Worse pains than this sourness that had come between them again and hung as sharp as the vinegar in the room. But no, she would not let herself be troubled. Not tonight. She sprang up since Hannah would not accept her attempts to help. What if Joseph arrived before she changed her spattered tunic or brushed her hair? She caught her breath before the enormity of his coming. Its miracle sweetened the air. Then forgive me, mother. If there's nothing more I can do, I'll go to prepare for my father's guest. Hannah lowered her hand and gazed at her daughter. Your father's guest, she said, in the middle of the week, not even on the Sabbath, and flesh roasting, a duck, and you speak of your father's guest? Would that he were to be your guest too, Mary said. Would that you felt like rising and freshening yourself and coming down to greet him. I'm ill. Hannah turned her face to the wall once more. There are hammer blows on my head and nails in my heart. And nobody cares, neither you nor your father. Nothing matters but that coming guest of yours. I care, mother, Mary said. I'd stay with you if I could, but since I can't, let me call Salome. No, 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 go on. If I can't have you, I don't want anyone. Go and make yourself fair, she said, for your father's guest. Mary bathed swiftly from her own basin of soft cistern water. She kicked aside her stained tunic and pulled a fresh one of pale blue over her head. Its cool touch against her skin was calming. It helped to stifle the resentment that had come out of nowhere and had been smoldering, gaining strength, until now it seemed to be burning deep within her. This is my mother's house, and these are her children. Wherefore is it that she leaves me alone to cope with them when I have already prepared the meal? Then she thought, No, no, my mother is ill. But she had to bite her quivering lips for it was surely tonight's event that had brought Hannah's illness on. And if one visit was enough to drive Hannah to her bed, what of more serious demands? A sudden desolation came over Mary. She stood very still for a moment, giving herself over to the hopelessness. Then she brushed and bound up her damp, dark hair and went below. Joseph came early in his eagerness. 
He arrived before Joachim was in from the fields. The children who had been perched on the step watching for him ran shouting the news to Mary, who had brought the duck indoors. It was indeed burned on one side, she saw. Well, no matter, she'd carved the other side to be served to the men. She and the young ones would eat the bitter side later. A flat, dull resignation had replaced her earlier nervousness. Here he was. She had assaulted him brazenly on a public street this morning and then bullied her father into inviting him, and now, dutifully, he had appeared, only to find her mother absent and her father still not home. It served her right for her folly, this humiliation that seemed symbolized in the charred, half-ruined duck. But since there was no one doing any of it, go now and get it over with. Holding her head high, she went to greet him. Peace be with you, she said, and please forgive my mother's absence. She bids you enjoy the hospitality of this house, which she regrets she can't extend to you herself since she is ill. Joseph had come. He was truly here. He was standing before her, washing his hands, taller than she'd believed, remote and grave with his tense cleft chin, and even more fair than she remembered. She longed to search his eyes, to see if his mood matched that of the morning, but she did not dare. Instead, she fastened her gaze upon his hands. How large, how rough and fiercely beautiful were the hands of a man. A little forest of black hairs grew on Joseph's long fingers, sturdy and brittle like the fragrant seas of brushwood that ran triumphant over rocks and fields. She noticed that the hands were not quite steady. Joseph was trembling. In astonishment and pain for him, she saw that he sloshed the water on the floor and dropped the towel. Oh, forgive my clumsiness, he said. He bent over to retrieve it, silently cursing himself. To be here with her, a guest at her father's table, and have his limbs betray him? His suffering gaze met Mary's. Was she laughing at him or trying to console him? Impossible to tell, for she had turned abruptly away, startled by the voice behind her. Peace be with you, Joseph. Here, now don't use that towel. We have more. Hannah stood there, holding out another towel. Her small sunken eyes were distant and chilling. Her mouth was tight for all of its courteous words. She had caught Joseph at his worst, the awkward groping for the dropped linen, the strong, assertive face gone scarlet with embarrassment, and the hands that had so moved Mary. She was newly conscious of their scars. But the main thing was that Hannah had risen. She had put on fresh garments and twisted her hair into a hard little knot and came down. I'm glad you're feeling better, Mother, Mary said, and scarcely knowing what she was doing, she snatched the abandoned towel and ran with it. Outside, she leaned limp against the wall for a moment. The scrap of cloth pressed against her cheek. It was still warm from his touch. It bore the marks of his hands. Oh, let her father come soon and make Joseph truly welcome. And let her mother be in a good mood after all, kindly and entertaining the way she could if she wanted. An amused tenderness came over Mary. She might have known that her mother would join them, if only because Hannah couldn't bear to miss anything. There now, her father was coming along the path from the olive grove. The sun had already vanished behind the mountains, but for a moment before the darkness fell, it scarlet and flamed the sky. And against it, between the shimmering silver of the trees and the small crouch shed, she saw him and the ox in silhouette tired beasts, both of them, heavy and stolid, pushing hopefully toward the evening's rest, and wonder and gratefulness flooded her afresh, akin to the wretch of awed pity that she had felt at the sight of Joseph's hands. Stuffing the little towel impulsively in her tunic, she ran to help her father with the ox. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, father. Joseph is here, and mother's feeling better, and now surely all will go well. In the house, Joseph sat playing with the children, while Hannah rattled bowls and vessels and darted about in a burst of animation, correcting the meal. She snatched off a dish of dates that seemed to her too dry and added more curds. Where were the onions? No meal was complete without onions. She thumped and rearranged cushions. As for the duck, the near tragedy that had befallen that rare indulgence struck her as both fitting and devastating. How could they let it burn? I can't turn my back for a minute, Esau and Salome. Somebody stop those children from clamoring. Oh, oh, but I'm used to children, said Joseph. Remember, there are even more of them in our house. Joseph caressed the curly fluff that covered the head of three-year-old Judith. It was like Mary's. It, too, would strive to escape its braid some day. His eyes sought hers where she knelt by the hearth. I love children, he said, and the words, however open, 
bore a message for her alone. Joachim had come in and washed himself. He greeted the guest cordially, but with a trace of something restrained, vaguely on guard. The two of them sat down while Mary and her mother served the food. The silence was uncomfortable at first as they dipped their bread, each groping. Mary sensed painfully that they were having a tough time saying something to each other. Then gradually their voices rose above the click and rattle of the bowls. The gruff, weary, and opinionated nasal of Joachim and the respected golden tones of Joseph, discussing the subjects on which men could always talk about and get heated, taxes, tributes, and the latest atrocities of Herod. A man in my father's shop brought word that he's not only still torturing and murdering people around Jerusalem, but he's put another of his own sons to death. Good riddance, Joachim said grimly. They're all a nest of vipers. How can they help it, the issue of a man who's neither Roman nor true Jew? Uh, he's only a circumcised Arab anyway. Joseph looked at Joachim while Joachim grunted. Yes, as the joke goes, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son, for at least he makes the gesture of not eating pork. He leaned forward, liking the youth who did not sit in mute agreement, however anxious he surely was to make a good impression. And Rome, do you think she'll ever spit out this vassal and send us a better successor? He can't last long, said Joseph. He's not only possessed, they say he's dying of some awful affliction. Herod, he thought wretchedly perspiring, why had he ever brought up the ugly subject? Instead of being tactful and diffident before an elder, he's blundered, trying to overcome his nervousness by saying far too much. At least he might have hit upon something more pleasant for this meal at Mary's house. But his successor, Joachim said, do you think Judah will ever enjoy better days under any Roman emperor? Joseph hesitated before the challenge. There's only one real hope for the land of Judah, he said, and that's the coming of our own ruler even he that has been promised for so long. And you believe in this Messiah? You believe he'll come soon? As a good Jew, I believe in the prophets who've told us that one day he will come. But when? Joseph made a helpless gesture. We've endured so much for so many generations, and each time the people thought they could endure no more. Just as we feel we've reached the limit of our endurance now. Surely if the Lord truly intends to send us a deliverer, the time is ripe for our travail is as great or worse than any other time since our forefathers left Babylon. Maybe the Lord is testing our patience, as the prophets had warned, Joachim said, making us wait until we're worthy of our own deliverance. Wait until we've come to understand more of the true nature of Yahweh before the Messiah comes. But how shall we know when he does? Now it was Joseph who demanded an answer. How can we be sure? The false prophets, those who honestly think themselves the Savior, we've seen what happens to them and to the poor souls in their desperation who follow them. Joachim nodded and wiped his fingers. We'll know, he said. The Lord will give us a sign. It depressed Mary to hear them, and the dumb compassion rose in her once again. Exasperation shook her. Oh, oh, speak of something else. Speak of youth and love and marriage. Speak of me. The towel still lay cradled near her heart. She wished she could speak her thoughts. Slowly, in a sweet lassitude of love, she moved back into the house that was, was still carrying the scent of the food and the flickering oil lamps. She wished that Joseph knew that the towel was nestled against her heart, that she would sleep with it beneath her cheek that night. We'll stop there near the end of chapter 4. We'll find out next time what happens and what comes of this as we continue our love story of Mary and Joseph, written by Marjorie Holmes, Two from Galilee.